Radar 61661, report to Division Headquarters. Code 3, repeat Code 3. Last time I had a 3 was when some hooker vomited Thunderbird on Bryant's desk. Many adventure games age horribly. The entire genre is like the dairy product of video games. But for every few dozen cartons of spoiled milk that you want to spit out immediately after trying it, there's some fine aged cheese in there too. The 1997 Blade Runner game is one of them. It has everything that made the genre great without the nonsense that made it awful. So when GOG had a surprise release of the game last month, I figured the Warhammer videos can be on hold for this one. Okay, let's get started. We start off with the same crawl from the movie. The story takes place in the nightmare future of 2019. Artificial humans called replicants have been created and they're mainly used for off-world slave labor. They've been made illegal on Earth after some of them rebelled and a special police force called Blade Runners is used to hunt them down. How about a fun fact? An extra in the Prometheus Blu-ray says that Blade Runner and Alien are in the same universe now. Uh, all right. I guess it adds up. I'd probably revolt too if this was my day job. Anyway, once again, the story takes place in the disgusting, polluted, influencer-infested L.A. Then we have a man talking to his 14-year-old employee. Oh, Lucy, my sweet. I cleaned out the tiger cage and sorted all the meal bins. So, if it's all right, it's my turn to fix dinner. D uh, haven't you forgotten something, little one? Just one little thing. Mr. Renser, please. It's been a very long day. I don't want to. Now, Lucy, I thought we'd settled this last week. Don't let's forget who pays your salary. We're closed. Come back tomorrow. Wait, I haven't finished with you. I told you, we're closed. We're not here to buy, little man. We've come to sell. The first crime scene is set up, though it's not clear what exactly happens until the game starts. For whatever reason, this guy always makes me think of Fred Durst and the G-Man. Oh my god, no! That tiger is the rarest specimen ever seen! Tiger, tiger, burning bright. The forest of the night. This is where the player comes in. Blade Runner Ray McCoy. To no great shock, the Pet Shop Boys are suspected of being replicants. You need to track them down before they get into more serious monkey business. This is where the gameplay actually starts. But before I get into all that, I want to talk about the presentation. For a 1997 adventure game, it is incredibly impressive. All the animation, detail, and other effects in the background is just staggering. Seeing the mist and fog from the rain, the reflections of all the lights in the puddles. As far as pre-rendered backgrounds go, this is up there. This is really up there. And being a movie licensed game, it's also incredibly faithful to the locations in the film. Even when things needed to be compromised, you can still see how much attention and love was given to making sure that each and every scene still captures the spirit of the movie. Sure, it can't always be one-to-one, -one, but that's what happens when you try to adapt one of the most visually impressive movies ever made. There are still plenty of original locations, and they all fit the world. It all comes together perfectly. You can't be too surprised. I mean, it's a Westwood game after all. My god, I miss Westwood like you wouldn't believe. Now everything is a nightmare. Now, some of the character models can be on the blurry side. A lot of people think it's a voxel-based game because it looks like one, but it's not. I'm Lewis Castle, the co-founder of Westwood Studios, the executive producer, art director, and technical director for Blade Runner The Game. So when we were making the characters of Blade Runner, we had these models, and I think people are familiar with models and polygons. Well, we had to represent them in a world that was 3D, so we used voxels. Oh, wait. The core programmer said it only started as voxels. They were too intensive to actually have in the game, so they instead used something called the slice model. Slice modeling, or slice animation, is pretty unique. Essentially, they made a 3D model, but then cut it horizontally a few hundred times. Think of it like a stack of books or magazines. So you may be wondering why this was being rendered in such a strange way. Well, this saves a lot of processing power in a computer from 20 years ago. The trade-off is that the engine can only comprehend rotating things around the Y-axis, but you could still technically render it from any angle, so maybe it could still count as voxels? Maybe Lewis Castle didn't want to get too technical in a short interview. The models were voxels, but then cut up in some arcane rendering technique. Wait, here he calls them voxels light. I... Whatever, who cares? Let's just say it's voxels, please look forward to the comment war in the Outcast video. Long story short, they couldn't optimize every animation and object by hand, so sometimes things will look weird. It still looks fantastic overall, it's just a side effect of ambition. What they actually made was just too powerful. Honestly, the word ambition is the best way to describe this game. There are multiple cutscenes on top of this, and cutscenes for each ending, which there are several for Blade Runner. Yeah, it's nearing a quarter century old now, but the art direction is just so good that it holds up. I was worried about having nostalgia goggles and want to replay this, but no. Then we have the sound. In particular, the music. 
Zubin was the first Nexus 6 I'd come up against. There was something in his eyes, an almost primordial desire to live. Most of the 3s, 4s, and 5s I'd seen would just give up when you had them. But these 6s, they were a whole other breed. They never actually had the rights to get the film's music, so they brought in Command & Conquer composer Frank Klopacki to make some tracks. Then he recreated the music from the Blade Runner movie by ear. This man made Hellmarch. He's beyond us. Does this girl ever eat around here? Nah, all Gaijin look like the old man. The soundscape is solid, but the voice acting especially is impressive. A majority of the original film cast came back for this game. The facts of life. Unfortunately, your way is illegal. For the moment, yes. But laws can be changed. And if replicants were allowed to work on Earth, imagine what your legacy would be. Governor Maurice Kolvig the national hero who eliminated toxic debris. <laughs> Even your opponents will vote for you. Excuse me. Deliveries to rare. LPD, I got a couple of questions. <laughs> you wait, you know take up time. Busy, busy. Sometimes performances can fall flat, but this was still extremely rare. Actually having the Hollywood actors come back for their role in a licensed game is no small feat. The new cast they hired is just as good and often better than the film actors. You killed anyone yet? It's like I said before, you retire a human, your career is over. Your life too, maybe. But we don't live forever, do we? You got good eyes. They ought to be. They're the only organs of mine that survived the Phobos Wars intact. Ray McCoy, Rep D-Tech. Blade Runner, huh? Though when I say fall flat, I unfortunately usually think about the main character. Are you taking any drugs? To be fair, McCoy is a detective and he has to do a lot of internal monologuing. It's also par for the course of the setting, and he has a lot of great moments still. After all, he's the fun Blade Runner. Piece of chrome. From a car? No, I think it's horse chrome. Bag it and tag it. What's the secret to his happiness? He owns a dog. Who's the best dog in the whole world? Here you go, baby. Dinner time. A real dog. So to sum it up, this game has extraordinary presentation. Even after all these years, it's still one of the most impressive looking adventure games I've ever played. Though, to be fair, I do play a lot of bad adventure games. No joke, they're basically like bowling alley animations with a plot. I don't think my brain is broken on this one, it looks good. So now we can talk about the gameplay and what makes it so good, or rather, what stops it from being so horrible. There are three difficulty options, and they mainly affect combat. Easy will make every item you buy free, so you won't have to worry about money. However, I can't recall anything you need to buy to complete the game. No special items that you can't buy and screw yourself over on. Money is nice to have, but for once, it's not required. Another option is for your automatic conversation choices. Alternatively, you can just pick options yourself. Designer Cut takes away a lot of fluff dialogue and lore. Can't say I recommend that. What's shaking, baby? I'm gonna go through some aspects that can make this genre unbearable. How about convoluted puzzles? Well, guess what? This game has none. No using items on objects. No combining things with madman logic. Nothing that you need a guide to figure out. This is an open world detective game. You go to an area, find clues, and figure out where to go from there. I suppose that deciding when to use your gun is a kind of puzzle? But I mean, it's obvious what to do when you see a rat. <laughs> Actually, there kind of is that one gun puzzle with the rat, and- Oh god damn it! There's nothing you can't figure out logically. This alone makes it more tolerable than most of the genre, but there's more. A lot more. Ain't you ever heard of private property? As a Blade Runner, you'll be investigating several crime scenes, and you have tools at your disposal to do so. You have the traditional click on items to collect things, and thankfully none are a pixel hunt. You can spend a few minutes in each room, but nothing is horribly cryptic. You can also question people using the evidence you've collected, or information you already know. You can also try out the enhanced version of questioning. I have nothing more to say to you, Detective. What? Why? Tell me about Luther and Lance. The... Who? You can also retrieve photos and videos to use the famous Esper machine. That's right! This could be you! Enhance. Stop. Enhance. Zoom to 15.
Oh, there's nothing over here. Is that Alex Denton from Invisible War? Track 45 right. It's actually not too bad. I only have two real issues with it. The first is sometimes you have to enhance the same object area, but in two very different specific close-ups of it. So you might think you had all the evidence, but you magically have more there. The second is that they decide to be realistic. McCoy never says, I think that's everything, or something like that. So you can have all the evidence from an image and not know it. But it's not a huge issue because the game has redundant clues. So trickier things usually have two or three ways to find them, so you don't get gated off. What you do need to find the Esper will usually be more obvious. Back to groundwork, you can attempt to administer a Voight Kampf exam. This will tell you who's truly human, and who is made out of Pillsbury biscuit dough. You need to carefully balance the intensity of your questions. Someone might get angry at the test and quit, but that doesn't mean they're a replicant. You keep paging through it, seeing picture after picture of animals laid to waste, each more gruesome than the last. So this is how this test goes, huh? You asking me sick questions. It's designed to provoke you. Is that right? You still don't need the test to retire the biscuit boys, it's just a sure thing. Your menu will organize evidence pointing to them being a replicant or not, and you can sort through all of it and decide for yourself. Does circumstantial evidence point to them being an off-world combat model, or maybe they're an amateur just trying to help the guys out? It plays like an actual investigation, not clown brain item juggling. There is a lot at play in each game, and it gets even better. Blade Runner has multiple random parameters with each new game. Someone destined to die in one will live in another. Different pieces of evidence get unlocked. Who is a replicant or not changes. What happens to characters out of your control, random encounters. Other Blade Runners might find their own evidence and upload it to police computers. This game has several endings for a reason. It's highly replayable. In one game you could go, this range training seemed excessive and these ammo types seem like overkill. Then when you go through an area that you thought was safe, you see the Chaos Sewer Mutants. In one game I was sympathetic to the replicants. In another, I went for the true LAPD experience. You know, shooting some hobo and tossing his body in the dumpster. Then you tell your boss, I'll know nothing about that, I was never there. I know it's science fiction and all that. Still, it makes me shudder to think about. I mean, could you imagine that Los Angeles was a real city? And that people would want to live there? <laughs> okay, anyway. There was nothing really bad that took me out of the game. It was more things that were either underused or seemed only half implemented. The police station has an entire forensics lab, and in most playthroughs, I only use it one time. You can upgrade your personal computer to hide evidence from the police database in case it's infiltrated. I have used it, but it never seems to change anything. Once again, it's a result of ambition. There's going to be even more to this game. And we might still get it. The Scum VM team who got it working in the first place are helping to restore the content. There's still stuff in the files. There are new conversation options, events, animations, sound. Chinatown. There's no telling what else can be put back in. It's very much a work in progress. I'm just gonna go ahead and say if you're interested in this game, go buy it. There's a link to it in the pinned comment. I'm talking story and spoilers from here on out, so now might be your time to go. Step up, step up. Mama Isabella cook you something special. Put a glow in your cheek. Rather than a prequel or sequel, the game runs parallel to the original movie. You don't talk directly to Deckard, but you see him around and signs of him. It's interesting because the story copies a lot from the movie, but it's doing its own thing at the same time as the movie. Okay, what's similar? Well, a lot of familiar sights and moments happen. Snake scale clue. Snake scale clue. Deckard goes to Sebastian's. McCoy goes to Sebastian's. Deckard puts on a funny voice to talk to a stripper. Excuse me, Miss Salome, can I talk to you for a minute? McCoy does the exact same thing with the Lady of the Night. Replicants also came to Earth through a violent hijacking. Their leader Clovis brought them to Earth because he wants to go to Tyrell and try to get more life. There is a lot that's recycled from the movie. Kind of appropriately, emulating Harrison Ford's character will give you one of the weaker endings. You finally get to Clovis and he's dying. A role reversal. You can either retire him or let him die peacefully, and it's not a horrible ending, but it's weak because we're competing with Tears and Rain here. Roy also has a lot more screen time to empathize with him. We don't get that with Clovis, so when they do try to imitate Tears and Rain, it comes off as hollow. It's the same I cherish life at the end message, but more just him regretting revenge. But this is only one of many endings. There will be some more to talk about. The elements that are different I actually found to be a lot stronger than the movie. Instead of just go find and shoot the Pillsbury people, there's more thrill to it here. You don't know who all the replicants are. People who you think might be allies could be working with them. The police itself might be compromised. Instead of just hunting replicants, a police corruption scandal becomes the center point. This transforms the least interesting question in the movie to being the most fascinating one in the game. Is the Blade Runner a replicant? Originally it was just a little thing to think about, like, oh, that'd be ironic. Then the final cut implies he's 100% a replicant, which undermines a lot and is fucking silly. The game takes that concept, and rather than it coming across like an afterthought, it's a central idea. 
In a later part of the story, the LAPD puts a warrant out for McCoy because the department has discovered he's a replicant. McCoy goes home and someone else is living there. How can that be possible, but even earlier in the game? That can't be me. Give me a hard copy of that. How could that be? McCoy was the newest member of the department, but he had records, right? A replicant doesn't necessarily care about what happens to another replicant. Then you must be a replicant. I'm sure I'm not. How do you know you're not a replicant? Did you ever take that test yourself? Sure I did. Long time ago. Don't replicants go around with false memories? Maybe somewhere along the line you killed a human, took his place, and your superiors don't even know about it. Interesting idea. But I'm still gonna give you the test. The department was incredibly shorthanded. They made combat models, so making police models wouldn't be too crazy. What's it like to hold the hand of someone you love, interlinked? Interlinked. What about the photo he found? Well, Clovis finds a pair of designers that are Siamese twins and reveals to them that they're replicants. And he does it with a photo. Clovis helped us see the light. But that's ridiculous. Tyrell wouldn't design something like you. He wants perfection. I told you we were a mistake. Keep talking. Clovis showed us our insect photos. So what? Pictures can lie. Why not test these guys? Well, they refuse it, so no way to know. McCoy survives gunshots and being poisoned by scorpions, but is that because he's a replicant or just because it's a video game? When he's knocked out, does he have a flashback of a memory on a distant world, or is he just dreaming? Well, she's not wearing a suit, so it can't be 100% real. A police officer says he saw your Inception photos, but he was corrupt in helping run guns for the replicants. He might just be saying that because you're about to bust him. Or he did see one, but it was one a replicant crime partner supplied. No matter what happens, it's ultimately ambiguous, and that's what makes it fun to think about and replay. Unlike the movie, you might be able to help the replicants find more life. Instead of hunting, you're helping. Welcome, brother. We have very little time. I spoke to Sadiq. He's installing the power source right now. Excellent. And do you have something for me? Or go for the big boss deep cover ending. Okay, I'm sorry. Where are we going? To the heavens, brother. To fulfill our destinies off-world. You don't have to pick either of these. You can leave them both behind, and you might not be alone. It's a whole zoo of ideas, dogs and tigers and all that. Way more than I could do justice to. At the end of the day, it's just a great game. The game did sell a lot when it came out, but like anything Blade Runner, it's expensive to make. You'd taken how ambitious it was, paying people rights for it, and of course it was printed on four CDs. So a sequel never happened. Strangely enough, the director of the Blade Runner sequel, Denis Villeneuve, Den Denis Villeneuve, Denis Villeneuve, is making a Dune film. Westwood also made some great Dune games, and you can't buy them anywhere anymore. Oh. Warhammer will continue, but when Blade Runner came back out, I had to do something with it. Anyhow, any chance for more videos on Star Wars games, i.e. Galactic Battlegrounds? Yeah, that one especially, yes. I loved Age of Empires 2, and then I bought that game, and it was just like, a reskin of Age of Empires 2, so I love that. Yeah, that'll be eventually. Do you write your own subtitles? They're very good even with musical cues. No, that would be Val Grimm. He's also done all the Russian translations, or at least proofreads them with me. He actually recently started uploading videos about doing subtitles, if that's kind of your thing. What's my best game of 2019? I still haven't finished a bunch of games that came out then, like Disco Elysium, and there's some I just haven't started on. But out of what I played, Pathologic 2. I'm still blown away by how much they improved over the first game, and I hope they get the other routes out eventually. I guess we'll see. How much different is your real voice than YouTube voice? Not that much. Whenever I talk to people over the internet, they'll go, Oh, you sound like the videos. It's because I don't do this. Don't overproduce audio, everyone can tell. That's your lesson for- I think the coyotes are back. Scorpions. Oh.